The next step after tonight is for us to fine tune the draft plan, send it up to the Commission of Forest Park. Thank you very much for coming out to talk about a lake and piece of public land that's near and dear to many of us. My name is Nate McKean. I'm the District Forestry Manager for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Um, I cover the southern part of the state for the Forestry Division. And previous to this position, I was Operations Chief for the State Park System. And previous to that, I was Parks Regional Manager when we did the first um, original plan for Lowell Lake State Park. And I led that uh, charge for about, uh, took us about a year and a half, two years, you said? Yeah, there he is with me. So is Shannon and Lisa. And Lisa's husband. Uh, this is Tim Morton. He's our district stewardship forester. He manages many thousands of uh, acres of state land and manages our district uh, stewardship team, which is made up of parks folks, fish and wildlife folks, DEC folks, led by Tim. Uh, he uh, works a lot in our, our long range management planning process um, and a bunch of other work. Good evening. This is Ethan Phelps. He's the Parks Regional Manager. He manages uh, 14 state parks in southeastern Vermont, including Lowell Lake State Park. Uh, and these two uh, will be doing most of the uh, presentation tonight. I'm just facilitating the meeting, uh, so I'm going to be opening things up and also making sure we're done by 7. So to give you a quick outline of how we got to where we are tonight, um, we had the original plan, which was finished in 2000, or 1999. And uh, we've been operating um, under that plan since then. And in recent years, the use patterns have really changed quite a bit at Lowell Lake. And uh, enough time had gone by that we decided it was time to reopen the planning process and amend the original plan. Uh, so we developed a draft plan uh, and then came and presented that um, in a public forum, received uh, some comments at the forum, and then a number of comments via email or phone calls or other avenues uh, during the public uh, comment period. We uh, incorporated those comments um, as much as we could, came back and uh, had a smaller scoping group to talk about the comments. Uh, we're going to get some feedback from a smaller group of really interested folks. And we developed a responsive summary, which uh, was our response to all the comments that we received. Um, and then we committed to coming and presenting those again in a public forum, which is what we're doing tonight, presenting uh, the, our response to the comments. Um, and how we've incorporated them. The next step after tonight is for us to fine tune the draft plan, send it up to the Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. He reviews it, um, and then from there, from there it goes on to the Secretary of the Agency, and uh, she signs it. And then um, Ethan and Tim are going to talk a little bit more about the next steps. But once the plan is signed, then the a lot of the land management side of it. The forestry side of it, we can begin um, incorporating, incorporating into our annual stewardship plans for vegetative management and things like that. On the facility side, um, there's, there's another step, um, a master planning process, which will also incorporate public input, which Ethan is going to talk to talk about a little bit. So the purpose of tonight, again, is for us to represent, uh, present um, how we've incorporated the comments and responded to them. And I'll let you know what the next steps are. And get out of here by 7. <laughs> and we'll also let you know how you can stay involved uh, from this point forward. <coughs> Anything to add to that, Tim or Ethan, before I turn um, it over? The comments, um, we, we've categorized them and grouped them into kind of broad subject areas, and that's kind of how we'll be presenting the, the summary of the responses. And um, ideally, 
we, you hold your questions until the end, unless it's something you just can't wait, that's fine, you can ask it, but uh, hopefully we can just have a question and answer session um, toward the end. Okay, Tim. Okay, thank you, Nate. The, um, and was mentioned, as was mentioned, the responsiveness summary is a form of document that exists in the management plan. We reference it in the course of managing a property. And we also use the responsiveness summary in the process of um, adapting the long range management plan to comments we received by the public. And so it will live in two places in the plan, both in the plan itself as a reference document and in some of the changes that would occur in a management plan based on the public input. And that's, ex and that's explained in the uh, summary. The, um, the grouping of the comments is also reflected in how we set up the responsiveness summary and which we have, and we'll pass those out at the end of the speaking so that you're not flipping through it while we're trying to visit with you. And um, this is going to be um, so a summary of the summary. That's what I'm about to give you. So if you're looking for more detail, you're probably going to find it in the document. The um, one, one series of comments we got that um, in writing was about mission. and the perception or belief that what we are proposing conflicted with the mission statements and the mission of the departments that manage and uh, low late. And I want to assure you that that's not necessarily the case. We have a broad mission and we try to accomplish a number of things on any particular piece of par a parcel of land, but within our statutory authority and our mission statements, um, our executive direction, we work for the executive branch. Uh, that we get with each new administration and throughout that administration's term. Uh, within the manage uh, MOU, the document that guides our cooperative work between the different agency of natural resources departments on the land and through our long range management plan process, we have identified and specified that we have a number of broad goals and they include forest and timber management, outdoor recreation development and maintenance, restoration and protection of water quality, biodiversity and natural community conservation, and the protection and interpretation of historic resources. And so those broad goals are reflected in the work we do on the various parcels that we manage. The, um, if you were to narrow that or broaden those further, you would look at it as sort of three different types of management or ways of looking at management. We have use, conservation, and protection. And we attempt to do all three of those things on any parcel that we manage based on the resources that we find and the, the uh, objectives of the parcel. So, Parks Department's mission is similar to the Department of Forest and Parks in that they're also charged with conserving natural and cultural resources and at the same time providing recreational opportunities and economic benefit. So the various um, projects that we have outlined for Lowell Lake and all of the state lands that we manage generally fall into those broad categories and then we refine them based on what's on the, what's on the land and what the land can can provide and what the land can tolerate and what the special resources are and what the goals for the property are. So that's how we see it and that's outlined in more detail on the, uh, in the summary, but that's a general sense of how we look at the land and what our charge is. Um, the next, the next uh, subset of comments under the planning and implementation um, theme um, revolved around the, the draft goals from the a 1999 plan and um, a feeling that they didn't reflect the current situation or the current um, type or level of use um, and what the public has grown accustomed to. Um, so we went back and we reviewed the document um, and discovered that many of those goals from the original plan do still remain relevant, um, but certainly uh, the levels and types of uses have changed. Um, when the original plan was created, uh, day use was not really anticipated to be a, a major component of the park, and as we all know, um, that has grown to be the primary focus at present. Um, so moving forward, more emphasis certainly will be placed on the day, the day use component. Um, there have been some, some components of the over, potential overnight use that would be scaled back. Um, and making sure that any proposed activities or uh, management of current activity would be compatible with current, um, current recreational demand and trends and uses. Um, the next theme was that, um, that, there, that there should be more information included, um, particularly site plan, um, as to how some of the 
the concept developments would work um, in the intensive use area, and that would be the area that's considered uh, where the cabins are and, and the parking um, and the, the focus of where most of the people go when they spend their time at Rural Lake. Um, so the next, the next logical step um, really would be to create a, a master plan, um, which would, um, for the intensive use area. The master plan um, is really the next step of planning where, you really, where we really get, get a chance to dig into um, you know, how things would really work. Um, it would establish the goals and objectives and priorities for what um, we feel the park would, um, would really what we would want it to become. Um, it would be bound, bounded by our known limitations, incorporate the concerns, issues, constraints, regulations, everything like that. Um, establish um, some cost estimates and uh, revenue projections for anything that would be proposed. And um, significantly, it would involve public input through the whole entire process beginning um, with that. And we, this is a process, this master planning process um, for the developed parts of parks is something that we've um, undertaken in more recent years, you know, when parks were developed in the 30s or the 60s or even, in, um, you know, 30 years ago, this master plan, uh, planning level, um, the, uh, level of planning that we do now, um, we didn't do then. Um, and um, I have an example of something that we're just wrapping up of a master planning um, project um, that really helps us create a concept for responsible and sustainable development. Um, with all of the with all of the constraints of public concern, because we know that um, concern also equals care. Um, that everybody in this room cares about the park and wants to see it managed responsibly and sustainably. Um, as an example, um, we have a relatively new state park in Springfield um, called Muckross State Park um, that we embarked on a master planning process for um, just under a year ago. We kicked that off and. Um, we started out the planning process um, by laying out some very broad goals and objectives um, that we, or broad goals that we wanted to see happen to the park. And then we held, um, we held a public forum and asked the public what they wanted to see so that right from the beginning we knew um, what the community's expectations would be. Um, from that, a number of concepts were developed um, and, and drilled down and um, we've come up with some some documents that are still being finalized, but some um, more concrete uh, concept plans of what what we hope to accomplish there. Um, and we know all you know in this particular property. Um, you know we know the constraints of, of access um, of dealing with a property that has a dam on it, um, um, some very old historic structures, um, and um, the desire for trail access um, and some other public access. And so in some respects. Um, it had to share some similarities with Little Lake in that, in that respect. Um, we have experience doing this type of master planning process with properties that are similar to Little Lake where um, there's, con there's, there's um, concern and a bit of anxiety that, that the, the park be developed in the right way. Um, we have... In, I've, um, Traveled to and talked pretty extensively with um, with a planner uh, that led a process at Green River Reservoir State Park, which the state acquired about uh, a little over 20 years ago, um, just north of Morrisville in Hyde Park. Um, that shares some similarities in um, in you know the the care and the concern about you know, making sure that it that. Um, any development that would happen be um, done in the right way. Um, and I, um, in those conversations with the planner, um, we're using, um, we, I hope to use some of the information gained in um, being able to create the right comprehensive um, public process uh, for when we are able to move forward to a master planning um, process with Lowell Lake. <coughs> So you have some sense of, of my credentials. I'm Nate's correct. I manage the stewardship team meetings and the, the interaction with the different agencies that are involved in state land. I am responsible for the long-range management plan, the forestry and wildlife parts of those plans. So I do the planning work, but I'm also responsible for all the on-the-ground day-to-day work. And so the 
a lot of the things that we'll talk about on the ground that, that I do related to the Lowell Lake are things I actually am responsible for on a daily basis, which includes the road management, wildlife management, forestry management. And so my experiences are based on my actual work, not on what I see other people doing. The, um, and I've been doing it for 33 years, so I've learned a few things, um, some of them the hard way. The, um, and so I want to address the forestry concerns. And when I say forestry, I think what people really are talking about in this context is the idea of a timber harvest on Lowell Lake. And we have three units scheduled over a period of time that are different types of harvesting for different objectives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the concerns people had and then try to address those. The, um, a common theme was that there was concern that harvesting would decrease property values on adjacent properties and we could find no evidence that that would be the case and we've had no experience with that happening. The, um, and I'm pretty confident if we'd ever done that with someone's property, they would have heard about it and we've never, and since we've started doing this work, had a complaint about a direct effect on someone's property value. The, um, the projects tend to be short a short time frame and tend to be removed from residential properties, so they don't have a real direct impact on a person's an adjoining property. So the impacts are pretty are fairly minimal and have never been reflected in the property values that we're aware of. The um, some concern about aesthetics. The um, management plan builds in a 250 foot setback from the shore for forest management except for hazard trees. We do do hazard tree management within the places that people recreate just for safety purposes. The, um, when you combine the 250 foot setback with the buffer um, requirements along streams and trails and the um, topography of the parcel and also the um, primary objective written into the plan that we will not have um, any kind of openings visible from the lake, the um, aesthetic impact should be pretty minimal of what we end up doing there, and it will be a fairly small part of the parcel. The, um, and we've done this work on parcels very similar. If you want, if you spend time on Gale Meadows Pond, Echo Lake at Camp Plymouth State Park, Chester Reservoir, Springfield Reservoir, Brattleboro Reservoir, Nat Pond Number One. These are all places I've done forestry operations in the last 15 years. There was a concern that the um, logging would be extensive and destructive, and um, what we typically see on a parcel like Low Lake, in fact, on most state parcels, is that there are enough other resources that we're concerned about protecting that the footprint or the outline of a project area generally gets a bit of a different shape than it shows on a map, and it tends to shrink. So it's not a big circle. It tends to follow different features that we're staying away from. And it tends to shrink fairly dramatically. Uh, I would say in this district, the managed portion of forest lands ranges between 10 and 50 percent, meaning 10 to 50 percent of the land base is seeing actual forest management. 90 to 50 percent is not, depending on the parcel. The um, on parcels similar to Lowell Lake, we expect that of the actual forest land footprint, the land you can walk on, that with buffers and setbacks and other resources that are protected and areas that do not need treatment to meet our objectives, we'll probably see over the course of this plan a treatment on about a third of the property. So a third of the area broken up into thirds over time. The, um, the part about, there was also concern about the disruption of harvesting. And in this case, I've, I'm, I've added some specific things to the management plan to try to reduce that impact. The um, one thing we'll do that originally we'd scheduled an interval of two to four years between projects, and I've increased that. Or we started with two, I've increased it to four, and I've increased the time frame from five years to 10 years. So we're spreading out the projects over a longer time period so there'll be more space in between where nothing is happening. The, um, the plan will speak to thinning fairly conservatively anywhere that's within the viewshed and in the stands of trees that are high quality and um, visually and from a standpoint of tree quality. And that references some technical terms in the management plan, but what it generally means is that a forestry thinning, you might see 30% of the stems removed in a harvest, which allows for the stand to close back in in roughly 10 years. We had scheduled, um, for wildlife purposes, we have scheduled what we call patch cuts for habitat, and in this particular region, we're really focusing on snowshoe hare habitat when we do these patch openings. The, um, but we've reduced the maximum size 
uh, from five acres to three acres and the more typical size from one to two acres we're reducing it to one and a half to one acre so we're shrinking up the size of the potential openings um, to reduce the impact and I also think that will help us do a better job of regenerating softwood which also for a white pine and hemlock which is really the goal for this area. We also will run into the plan that in this particular area we will during harvesting we're going to we'll limit the hours of harvest operation and trucking and we will limit the products removed to limit the number of truck chips meaning what that really means is we won't harvest wood chips and by doing that uh, it reduces the truck traffic considerably from a harvest probably if you had a harvest that was going to have 50 truck trips and you didn't truck chips it would drop it probably to 20 25 that's the positive side the flip side is that of that is all that wood stays in the woods and so you have more wood in the woods that if you are someone that likes to walk around like i do off trail you've got more material to walk over that generally decays in five years or so There was concern about some of the access that we might use, uh, particularly Mountain Lake Road and, and, and a road, a private road that comes out of the Barber lot. And I can assure you we have no plans to use either of those roads for access. There was concern about clear cutting. We, have, we don't have any clear cutting scheduled for the property. Clear cutting is generally defined as something where all the stems are removed on a 10 acre unit or greater. And we are scheduling a small number of the patch cuts with a maximum size of three acres, most of them being one and a half to one acre. And I've outlined in the management plan that that would be at a max 30 acres over three projects over 10 years. So it's a fairly small portion of the property. And we've specified that those openings will not be visible from the lake or from the recreation area. Something I've never done before, I've included in the plan um, a reference to the value of red maple for foliage. Red maple for, for, in the forestry world is often a cull tree and often harvested fairly heavily to grow other species. Um, I know from my own use of Old Lake that red maple is a really important tree for the visual appeal of the area in the fall. And so we'll be retaining a high number of red maple in the thinning operations regardless of the quality tree and it will be more than we normally would. And that's outlined as an objective in the management plan. There was some current concern about how we protect private property during logging. Um, the first thing we do is we stay on state land. Uh, the boundaries are well marked and we don't go over boundaries for any reason. And we generally harvest, we do a setback from the boundary so that any tree felling doesn't risk falling onto somebody else's land. I've set it up in this management plan that we'll stay a tree length back from the boundary line if there's any residential property. If it's up against raw woodland, we typically will only harvest trees that are leaning away from the other boundary line so that when they fall, there's no chance of them falling on somebody else's property. And we require within 100 feet of the wall that any slash or the line, any slash has to be locked to the ground or pulled away. I've also specified in the management plan, which is an addition based on the public input, a tree length buffer between the property line and the harvest area. And um, near houses going a, a 200 foot zone of higher density retention. So we'll do similar to what I talked about before with the, with the pine stands where we would, know, would not reduce more than 30%. We'll do that as well near any homes if we're even in that area. It's, it's unlikely it will be, but if we were, we would be within 200 feet, we would have high density stands. However, if I check in with a, a neighbor and they would prefer that we cut more, then we can do that. And generally, I always check in if there's a house, unless there's dogs. Um, and every time I do it, to say, to ask, how would you like the stand that you're looking at to look? Do you want me to not cut in there? They always say, please cut more trees. And it's generally for sunlight or satellite reception or something, but we give people the option. And um, every, I've even done patch clear cuts for solar panels for people. So generally that's the request, but we, we do meet, we do seek out homeowners and talk to them. There was concern about the, the wetland, evaluation of wetlands in the process. And we did, um, the wetland delineation gets done by the state lands ecologist. It's done, starts with a GIS process. And now he's using LIDAR, which is even more effective. And it's followed up with ground truthing on the ground. And I did go to the site for unit one last summer. And we walked the whole unit and we looked at all the areas that GIS and LIDAR suggested were wetlands. 
we identified the ones that were wetlands and the ones that were not. Some of them were actually uplands that had been small patch cuts or group cuts years ago that have regenerated really well to young hardwood and softwood, and they show up differently in the, in the GIS layer. And um, he's requested a 100-foot buffer along all those wetland features, which is what we'll install in the project. Okay. Um, so not surprisingly, most of the comments that we received um, have to do with the next few sections, which are the visitor um, experience, uh, day use, and the potential overnight use of the property. Um, so those are all the sections I get to talk about. So you'll get to hear me um, for the next, hopefully not too long. Um, so the first section uh, with visitor experience or comments that had to do with uh, concern about capacity, overcrowding, visitor behavior, impacts the environment, the town, and things like that. Um, so uh, first group of comments was um, that the park is sometimes overcrowded and that more use will exacerbate the problem. And um, definitely, the park does get busy on weekends and holidays. Um, the parking lot was originally designed to fit about 15 people when it was thought that people would just kind of come and go on their own. Um, carefully managed, we can fit about 35 vehicles in there. Um, we've increased staff from a one part-time uh, park manager to three uh, full-time staff dedicated to the park um, to help manage the crowds and manage parking in particular. Um, we routinely have to shut the, park, uh, shut the parking down, which is our way of controlling the number of people in the park, um, particularly on weekends and um, busy summer holidays. And when we do that, the average wait time has been about 15 minutes. Um, this, year we, um, this year, we registered nearly 12,000 visitors um, between Memorial Day and Columbus Day. Um, so that's... That's a big number. It's um, we can ex we expect those numbers to keep on increasing, increasing. Um, but we have some some management techniques that we can use and that we hope to use to um, try to um, organize the use and um, manage that increase um, a little more and to keep it to sustainable levels. Um, those are um, the staff and uh, adding more staffing if we had to. Um, potentially adding user fees, which could be a, a possibility uh, in the near future. Um, a final decision at the administrative level has not um, been made, um, but we do have a park system in Vermont that um, is operated on user fees. If we did impl implement a day use fees at Lowell Lake State Park, uh, currently, at the numbers we had last summer, um, the revenue gained would su completely support the operation of the park as it as it runs now. Um, so that's that's something to consider. Um, uh, we, you know, and certainly we do um, wish to provide um, somewhat better designed parking facilities um, and some things like uh, better uh, bathroom facilities in the shape of composting toilets and some sort of office or visitor center. Right now, the staff, um, I'm sure if you were there at all last summer, um, operate out of a 10 by 10 pop-up tent, which um, if it's 70 degrees and um, decent weather is, is fine, but if it's really, really hot or if it's cold and rainy, that's not um, an ideal working environment for those folks. So we'd like to provide something um, better with that. Um, we do have experience in our park system. We have 56 state parks that we operate in staff now, so we have um, quite a depth of experience um, managing properties and, and managing use levels uh, throughout the state. Um, there was a, a group of comments um, about um, increasing use, damaging the park and resources, um, and the cemetery. Um, the cemetery is not actually part of the park. It's owned and managed by the town. Um, the state has for many years assisted with um, maintenance projects over the years, and we certainly will continue that. Um, recent, in recent years, our state park system has uh, logged um, at or near a million uh, visitors annually. Um, yet we continue to manage our parks to protect um, natural and cultural resources, and we're still able to provide high quality um, recreation experiences, clean facilities, and um, keep the vast majority of our visitors happy. Um, we ex fully expect we will continue to operate in Little Lake in that same manner. Um, 
The day use visits per year at Lowell Lake, um, around 12,000. That's comparable for other parks um, that have that less developed feel and more kind of trail experience um, in our system. Um, but that's also very low when you compare that um, to some of our more developed traditional um, day use parks. Um, there are some questions about how environmental uh, impacts will be monitored. Um, monitoring is included in any resource management projects or any um, potential construction projects that we do on our state lands. Um, visitor impacts are monitored by both park staff and stewardship staff. Um, forestry projects are evaluated every other year on average. Um, and uh, stewardship staff is um, in the process of developing a data management system um, that will um, help them with resource monitoring. Um, there are some comments about um, not respecting the community's wish to protect the natural appearance of the appearance of the Lowell Lake area. Um, we certainly. Uh, do wish to do that and um, think that we've taken that into account. Um, the aesthetic appeal of Lowell Lake is certainly one of the virtues and um, main assets of the park. Um, as we embark on a master planning process, um, high importance certainly would be um, placed on that. In addition, um, uh, you know, as Tim mentioned, buffers for forestry management projects, any potential development that would take place um, would uh, have would um, have any particular um, all applicable uh, local and state level um, rules, laws, and regulations that would apply, such as uh, local zoning, um, the state shoreland protection act, um, things like that. Um, there were some comments about some private uh, developments um, in their visibility, and the park should following the same. Um, certainly, a goal. In any type of um, uh, redevelopment of any of the cabins or anything like that would be to minimize um, visibility from the lake while providing some um, limited views, which was, um, that's something that's carried forth um, from the original plan. Um, we have, um, we do notice in other places where if um, we don't manage views in a controlled manner, um, visitors tend to take it on themselves to do that in an unorganized fashion, which has a much more, um, which has a much greater impact. Um, there were some questions about how can we project what increased use will be. Um, that's kind of a tricky thing, um, projecting into the future. Um, we do know that if we look over the past um, 10 years and past 15 years, the use has grown very rapidly, and we know that we, we don't want to continue to see that level of rapid growth. There's been a number of factors in that, um, particularly at Lowell Lake um, and at many of our parks. Um, you know, things like, um, like um, plastic kayaks, for instance. Um, many people have kayaks now. Lowell Lake's a perfect spot for that. Um, and just availability of information in the internet in and of itself um, um, can be um, attributed to that. Um, but certainly, um, planning and development and management strategies um, will be used to minimize and mitigate um, any impacts of in increased use. Um, there is concern that the development projects would dramatically change the character of the lake experience. Um, the, any concept that we would explore um, if we, when we go forward with the master uh, development plan, the park master plan, um, would keep the same, same general goals as the original plan, which would be to keep the low-key character and the rustic nature of the park. Um, certainly, we, um, you know, we don't want to see the character of the park change any more um, than anyone else does. Um, really, uh, through the master planning process, um, that will help us really um, do more thorough investigation and research in what any type of overnight reuse would, would uh, take place um, and what the, the realistic and feasible capacity of, of that would be. Um, the key really there is carefully planned management and develop, development. Um, there were concerns about developing, <coughs> polluting the, uh, the lake and displacing wildlife. Um, 
And as I mentioned before, any type of uh, management or redevelopment would be in accordance with all um, local, state, and federal laws that pr pr protect um, rare, threatened, and endangered species, water quality, um, and anything like that. Um, in general, in our state park system, we strive to have our parks serve as models um, for how construction activity can be undertaken and recreational opportunities can be developed um, while staying well within the laws and, and um, demonstrate best management practices. And I, you know, I, Lowell Lake could certainly be an opportunity um, to showcase how the Shoreland Protection Act um, could be enacted. Um, there were some comments about dogs and that Lowell Lake should be a dog-free uh, park um, because of the disturbance caused. Um, dogs definitely are a tricky and complex management issue for sure um, at many of our parks. Um, depending on the impacts, um, more stringent dog policies may be in order at Lowell Lake. Um, we are... Um, we, in a few other places where um, we get thousands of dogs a year, um, we've made some changes um, and tightened up some of our dog restrictions. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. But in general, we've seen some, um, we've seen some benefit from having more staff be um, at the park and having more interaction with visitors, um, and particularly um, visitors with dogs. Um, some comments that the behavior of some current users is unacceptable. Um, we agree with that. Um, and in recent, uh, leading up to um, the past few years, um, there have been more in, uh, incidents with increasing conflicts between visitors and dogs, um, other uh, visitors amongst themselves, fishermen and other groups. Um, but in general, um, with increased staff and increased staff presence and visitor education, we've seen those incidents decline. So we're pretty we're pretty pleased with that. Um, the park uh, there was a concern that the park would um, provide a location for improper use in crime. Um, we don't think that's that that will happen. Um, in general, um, we don't see that happening now, and we don't see that happening in the future. Um, our parks are all provide very safe places for people to recreate and enjoy the outdoors, and we don't see that there would be um, any difference at Lowell Lake State Park. Um, there are a few settings like Lowell Lake State Park, and it should remain, remain unchanged. Um, there are relatively few water bodies in southern Vermont when, you, when compared to other parts of the state. Um, any proposed act management or activity um, would be um, will manage public use very carefully rather than just let it continue with minimal management or oversight. Um, hence, that's why we've added staff um, and why we would like to add um, some convenience facilities for visitors. Um, There were some comments related to um, to um, limiting or restricting the park for local residents. Um, that runs contrary to our mission. Um, we don't have any um, parks where where use is limited based on um, residency. Um, our parks are open and open to all. Um, there's a group of comments related to parking um, and facilities um, for day users. And um, certainly, um, we would like to focus on that and um, provide better things like composting toilets, um, a better staff um, contact welcome facility, like I mentioned. Um, some sort of better design parking, and better design parking doesn't necessarily mean places for more cars. Um, you know, through the planning process, we want to um, determine what the right number of cars is, whether that's the what the number we have now, or that might be more, or maybe it might be less. Um, but that's something that certainly we would we would determine before just going out and building something. Um, There were some questions about park access and entrances. Um, we expect the existing park entrance um, off of, um, from Low, uh, Low Lake Road to Ice House Road to remain. 
Um, certainly through a uh, master planning process, we can explore the possibility of dual entrances with another one um, coming off of Little Pond Road, um, but with two entrances, um, that could bring in some more management complexity with um, having to have more staff or more entry points um, and controlling people um, that way. But that's certainly something we're willing to look at. Um, we've received comments for a few years about providing winter access at the park. Um, and we have been able to um, obtain funding from the state's recreation trail program um, beginning next winter uh, for the budget cycle will begin July 1st. So beginning for next year, we'll be able to plow and maintain the parking and I think also provide a portable toilet in the winter months um, for people there. So, so um, quite happy about that, that we were able to obtain grant funding to do that. Um, and then uh, uh, there, there's a fair number of comments about overnight improvements. Um, so there's a group of comments about the proposal being outside of the scope of the original plan. Um, the original plan um, and public dialogue that went into that included 17 public meetings um, that came down and agreed to the concept of um, redeveloping the cabins um, adding um, some lean-to camping um, in the existing kind of core area where the, the lodge and the cabins are. Um, from that, um, we've actually scaled that back. We've determined that um, the lean-to's and the outdoor camping part um, shouldn't be part of, part of anything that happens um, and that the footprint um, and that there is a lot of concern about the potential for growing the number of cabins or more buildings things like that. Um, so one of the things we would look at would be to um, not go over the existing number of units that are there now at the maximum. Um, and through the master planning process, really help us determine if there's 11 cabins there now, does 11 cabins make sense to reopen? Or is it five cabins, or three, or um, we don't know. So. We hope that the master planning process will really help us figure out um, the feasibility, um, the cost benefit uh, of, of that, and, and whether that's worth doing. Um, some comments about how the old cabins and buildings are an eyesore and should be removed. And then some comments about how they should be restored and made available to the public. So. Um, just about that, um, we have completed structural and historic <coughs> assessments on the buildings. Um, they are part of, they are certainly part of the uh, historic fabric of the park, and they tell a unique story of, of um, how people recreated there decades ago. Um, <coughs> you know, moving forward, if any were to be considered for reuse, um, certainly historic preservation would be balanced with accessibility, um, life safety, and cost. Um, whether they would be um, reused or potentially replaced or removed. Um, there was uh, some comment uh, about um, adding uh, educational programs or a nature center. Um, so as an alternative, um, we did uh, a number of years ago try to offer um, some interpretive programs at the park on its own. Um, it did not on its own uh, have a lot of draw. Um, but we do think that interpretive programs could be offered at some point in the future um, as an attraction um, for both day users and overnight users. Um, adding programming um, could complement overnight use. It would offer guests um, some on-site education uh, and entertainment and potentially reduce the need to travel um, in and out of the park as much. Um, there are concerns about light pollution and visibility of buildings <coughs> on the lake. Um, our, all of our new construction that we do in our Vermont State Parks, we um, do compliant with the UP, uh, US EPA dark sky um, requirements, um, which, minima, which um, eliminate upward facing light pollution. Um, in any of our existing rental cabins that we have, and our other state parks, um, they all have curtains, and none of them have exterior lighting. Um, so we would certainly be looking at that as well. 
Um, there was a, um, some comments received to consider um, remote hike or paddle to campsites along the shoreline or potentially on islands. Um, and certainly that's something that um, we could explore if it could be done within permitting requirements um, at potentially locations of some previously existing structures. Um, but we did initially say that we were committed to removing the concept of a developed outdoor um, <coughs> campground and sites kind of away from that original um, cabin core. Um, but certainly that's something we could, we could explore. Um, and then the last series of questions um, dealt with the economic impact um, of the park and of any potential overnight development. Um, and that there, are, that there are currently sufficient overnight opportunities in the Little Lake area and that um, having overnight use would compete with existing facilities. Um, what would be offered at Lowell Lake um, would be a pretty different, a distinctly different type of lodging um, than staying in a motel or a bed and breakfast um, or something like that. Um, it would be consistent with um, our offerings at other state parks, which are um, one-room cabins um, in, a, in a park setting. Um, and we think, we believe that overnight guests um, could bring additional tourism-driven revenue to Londonderry and the surrounding area um, and could be benefit. Um, the town, there was a comment that the town would have to pay for policing and other impacts. Um, we um, don't see that. Um, the state police currently provide police coverage um, to the park. Um, and fortunately, there's not a high level of, of need for that. Um, the state park also currently maintains um, the entire length of Ice House Road and um, certainly could continue doing that after further discussion with the town um, because parts of that are uh, class three and class four town road. Um, and there's, uh, there's some um, comments just relating about um, the funds that would be needed um, for um, redevelopment and the use of those, that funding and, and um, how that, um, the appropriateness of that. Um, so just a little background on how our park system is funded. Um, almost all of our parks um, have day entry fees during the operating season, which is typically May to September or May to early October. So. Uh, three and a half to about five month window of the year. The other times of the year, there is no charge um, to access any park. But during that operating season, um, those user fees that are collected um, go directly into what's called the park special fund, which is what pays to operate our state parks, that pays for um, the staff that you see there, it pays for the lawnmowers and the gas that goes in them, and all of the direct operating costs, the toilet paper, the cleaning supplies, and all of that. Um, the Park Special Fund is also has some proceeds from other uses of state land that go in that. Um, so operationally, our state park system is, is pretty close to self-sufficient. Um, for major infrastructure and construction projects, um, we receive um, a share of the state capital bill, um, capital funding. Um, we, the Vermont State Park System, has established a, a track record over the past 10 years um, our appropriation of the capital bid has been of two to three million dollars a year, and we've established a track record of successfully managing um, several million dollars worth of construction projects annually. Much of that, almost all of that money goes to small contractors and small businesses um, in the immediate areas and localities of where our parks are located. Um, we also have the opportunity to, to use um, some grant funds, such as the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, um, or potential uh, private donations, um, which we have recently received with some, um, at some other properties. Um, there is some concern about traffic um, and increased use of the lake and the roads and becoming a burden to the town. Um, we're not aware of any impacts um, that the park is having on public infrastructure. Um, there certainly could be more traffic on local roads if there are more people, that makes sense. Um, but the impact of that isn't really clear to us at this time. 
Um, there was a thread of comments about how um, day use fees would be unfair to local residents. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the concept of day use fees is still being explored um, actively. Um, and while a final decision hasn't been made, um, it's possible um, that one could be made in time for the opening of this year. Um, but if that decision is made, we certainly would um, would make that information available as soon as as soon as we can. Um, but as I also mentioned before, um, user fees are only charged during the operating season. So here, that would be about a five and a half month window. Um, we're about you know almost seven months of the year. There's no fee. Um, the day use fees are um, pretty low and can be as low as purchasing an individual pass for thirty dollars to for a person to access um, any state park um, for the day for the season. Um, so. Um, So we think that those fees, um, help, which would go back to offset the operation of the park, um, would be appropriate should they should they get implemented. Lastly, there were some comments about um, an investments that should be made to improving the beach. Um, and in the original plan, um, it, there were some strongly voiced um, comments made that um, there shouldn't be any beach development at Lola Lake um, and anything like that. And we, at this point, we still agree with that. Um, we feel that developing any kind of sand swimming beach or anything like that um, doesn't make a lot of, a lot of sense at, um, at Lola Lake because it would go against the character of the park. Um, and it would also be highly unlikely for us to obtain um, the permitting to do so. Um, so we still feel that that's probably not going to be part of the part of the future. That being said, um, swimming is informally enjoyed by a number of people at several locations in the park, um, and we'll, we will certainly do our best um, to make sure that 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 use is retained. Um, lastly, we just wanted to acknowledge that there was a petition that was submitted um, that was signed by many people in town. Um, we were happy and pleased to see the level of public comment that was received um, and to um, and, um, let everybody know that we understand and value the community's um, level of care and commitment to the park. Um, that's, we see that as a good thing and certainly I'm happy that all of you are here tonight to, to hear the responses uh, to the comments um, and we are committed um, to maintaining uh, uh, public input um, uh, as we move to a master planning process and have that be integral um, to that process to help us figure out um, what the next steps might be. Um, and it certainly will help us provide high quality um, and safe rec uh, recreational opportunities while protecting the natural resources of the park. Great, thanks. Um, so are there any questions about how we got to this point? Process questions and where, where we go from here? Um, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Robert Need. I'm the town administrator for Londonderry. <clears throat> in the plan document and in your comments earlier this evening, there was a reference to collaboration between departments, uh, agencies. But there was no specific reference to partnering with the town of Londonderry. And when you talked about constraints on the project, you talked about physical constraints. But again, there was no mention of land use regulations in the town of Londonderry or the town plan, for instance. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to hear is your position on local land use regulations um, and how you hope to integrate with the town of Londonderry as you move forward. Certainly. Um, land use, zoning, all of those things are um, will certainly be taken into account and we would absolutely work with the town. Yeah. 
could you be more specific about to what degree you would work with the town? And I'll give you, I'll give you an sure. example. A cursory look at the plan, yeah. um, kind of overlay on the current zoning bylaws, mm -hmm. shows potential for some conflicts, right. uh, for some non-compliance. Mm -hmm. So what would be your plan on resolving those issues of non-compliance and working with the sure. town? How so would that, you do that? That would be a starting point. It, starting with the conflicts with um, the regulatory hurdles, so that you're not planning something that's going to automatically be running into roadblocks. So that you get all of those constraints out at the beginning and know where can you start working and where, where can you actually start um, making some improvements. Yeah, in the original planning process, it was very broad representation from the town and the community. Um, and we, we moved forward with the planning process knowing that the plan doesn't um, supersede any town regulations or town concerns. State, federal, or, or local are very, um, we're obligated to, to abide by those. Any other questions about the process? Any other general questions or comments? Yes, sir. Is there a site plan map now showing what you're thinking about doing? There isn't because we haven't we haven't started the process. Um, that we would like to we would like to kick off the master planning process, which would develop a site plan. It would start with um, summarizing the the comments um, that we've received to date, um, looking at all of the constraints, looking at some of the goals um, that we have for the property, um, some of the goals that the community has for the property, and then go from there to develop a concept site plan. Could you refresh my memory? You started out and you said that you prepared a plan, I may, maybe I misunderstood, that was moving up the pipeline and then at some point this master planning process would start if I so what right so what moving up the pipeline is the long range management plan addendum the long range management plan addendum is um, is headed will go to the commissioner for review and approval if he is happy with what we've done in response to the comments and it's actually would be signed by um, the agency secretary as well that Approval is is allowing me to start implementing the land management part. It's, and it also is a, is setting us up for the next step on the on the park itself, the park facility area. That would be a separate process and a more detailed one. Once the management plan is approved, my projects go through an annual review. That's to do with our annual work plan that we develop in house, and then. Um, we do that each year based on the management plan. Ethan's projects are going to be going through this next level of which we this, this what is it called? A master park master development plan, um, which would focus on the facility side of things. So the broader long range plan is a, is a, is a uh, overarching in scope. And then the facility master plan that moves forward and um, the beginning of that is trying to figure out what, what the facilities should become um, at the park, how they should be used. And how will we be notified about um, the forestry management portion of it and how that's going to be implemented and when? We send notice to the town. Every year we, when we do the annual work plan, we send a letter to the town office outlining all the projects for their town each year. So it goes to your town select board, I believe. Um, so it will come to the town and, and, and um, in, in the mail, and then the, um, the management plans are online that reference the, part, the projects. So that's how we do it. Um, and that's really, there's really it's no other simple way for us to do it other than to send an annual notice, here's what we're planning on doing in the coming fiscal year. Yes, ma'am. So when you send that, then does the select board or do any of uh, us 
have a say on what that plan is? And we we developed the plan based. We developed it based on the long range management plan and the agency's objectives, and, and we have um, guidelines for, for riparian zone protection, archaeological protection, uh, ecological protection. So, our process is based is in house for the most part, and we don't have specific input on the meat and potatoes of the projects, how they're done. Well, but I guess I'm saying more like if there's something in that plan that seems to be you know, it, can that plan change then? If, if we've made a mistake or something isn't working, then we do amend management plans, yes. And sometimes it's formal, sometimes it's informal. I had a project at, at Downer State Forest that <clears throat> was planned and we got started and it didn't, wasn't making sense to me and I talked to the neighbors and it wasn't making sense to them. And so I wrote a formal addendum to the management plan saying that this project didn't make sense for the following reasons, and then the next management plan, we should convert this area to recreational use, not forestry. So we've done that sort of thing. I do an amendment to the plan. Um, I've never had anything so out of whack that we had to rewrite a plan based on a project, but generally we do treat them as we go. And like Tim mentioned, you know, very considerate of the neighbors. If you're in a budding a buddy property, um, well, what if you're not a neighbor? I mean, yeah. I understand. I mean, I think that's all great, but I mean, I don't live on the lake, but I'm very, you know. I, I can't think of a mechanism for you to get to me on something really specific mm -hmm. other than picking up the phone. Mm -hmm. And that's generally what happens. Mm -hmm. And then you respond. But it's an informal process. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never ignored anybody that's called me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just confirming. So online, you have a current management plan with a timeline involved in it. Once it's approved, yes, it's not it's there. That's propo pro proposed and told. The draft is there, and then we will edit the draft. And once it's signed, it will be. Assuming it's signed, then it will be. The old, that draft coming down, and the new one will go up. So then, my question would segue on to Bob Roberts. Uh, mm -hmm about the zoning bylaws and stuff, has that already been implemented into your plan of what our zoning laws are? I would say no, right? I mean, we're gonna develop a master well, plan. Right, I mean, that doesn't apply to the forestry management. And anything that it would apply, you know, as far as facilities or buildings, we haven't started any of that process yet. <laughs> Other than, I've read the zoning regulations, I know, you know, that it's the district that it's in. Um, and so that certainly would be one of the one of the starting points of, of looking at anything that would be proposed for development, I guess. But for your development purposes, you would have to abide by our town zoning by. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. We yes, are not exempt from any is there a short-term immediate plan on handling traffic on Long Lake itself, the road leading in? I mean, the last summer, lines of cars just idling, waiting to get in. And someone at the, at the end of Long Lake, you know, basically monitoring as one car comes in, one comes out. But what's happened is Long Lake Road becomes a parking lot on Saturdays and Sundays during the weekend. Is there any plan for dealing with that? And cars just sitting there idling all day. Right. Um, yes, definitely that's a complicated situation when the, there's more cars that can fit in the park. Um, and the town does not allow parking along the town road. Um, but that's certainly something I'm more than happy to work with the town and the highway department with to try to figure out a solution to that. And we have that situation in other parks for sure. And we end up putting up, working with the town, you know, using no parking signs and other, other normal techniques that you see all over the state. Um, but it's very challenging. And the park, the size of the parking lot limits the number of people in the park, but doesn't limit the number of people who may want to try to get into the park. So it's basically just going to be lines of cars to get anything out. Basically, this is going to be us working with the town, just the town road, and figuring out how we can you know, best manage it, the situation. 
and I think that the, the use has really, really uh, grown very rapidly there. So over time, hopefully folks will you know when you should go and when you can't go. Um, we've talked about doing a better job on our website so folks can check individual parks to see you know, what the status of the um, occupancy is, things like that. Do you think charging would decrease the amount of people trying to get into the park? Like what have you seen with that? Um, I would say that doesn't necessarily um, have a huge impact. Would you agree with that? Um, it could have a temporary impact. It could have a temporary um, impact. If you look at studies that have been done where fees have either been implemented, and this isn't specific to Lowell Lake or even Vermont necessarily, but in recreation areas where fees are either uh, first implemented or fees are raised, there tends to be a dip in attendance, and then over the next three to five years, it will um, will climb back up. Um, but that certainly could be something that could help curb some of that growth. Yes, ma'am. Do you work with the local community when you're developing developing your master plan? Absolutely. Do you have meetings with us? How how do you go about that? Um, the process the process can be laid out when, when, the, um, when the, the planning process is designed. Um, but yes, there's, usually, there's typically, the ones I've been involved in, there's been significant um, public meeting components um, at the start and throughout the process. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I was curious, you said earlier that um, you don't, for logging, you don't use Lower Lake Road. And if not, then how do they gain access? I, I didn't say that. I said we, we won't use, what's the class four road called? Mountain Lake. Mountain Lake Road, and, and we're not going to use the entrance to Barber Lake, but we would need to use the Barber Lot. Uh, we would need to use, the at some point, part of Lowell Lake and Little Pond Road. Okay. It would be fairly minimal. I, I, you know, back at the end of the calculations, <laughs> looking at the acreage that we would treat and the nut, the volume, and the typical progression of a harvest, I would be probably looking at truck traffic on for each job of about three months every three years. It's, it's pretty, it's not outside of the norm and probably below the norm of what we see in rural communities of Vermont where timber management is very common. And I'm sorry, what, what months does that generally happen? Generally it would happen it depends on the landscape and the capability of the land. <coughs> on these types of environments, it's typically in the winter. Yes, sir. Since there's increased staff monitoring the ingress and egress from the park, when the park is full, is it possible to dispatch, if the town allowed it, at the entrance to Lowell Lake from Route 11, um, a, a, a little sign that says, park occupancy currently full and then we could as a town um, when that sign goes up it add an additional piece that says there is no standing on Lowell Lake Road while waiting to get into the park because yeah, we you do control in yeah. ingress and egress yeah. And when it's full, you've reached the maximum that the staff has agreed the top park can tolerate. Right. So by communicating further out the road mm -hmm. that the park is full, I believe that it could ameliorate those incredible parking lot feelings that we get when we try and go to Lowell Lake. Anything we can do to keep our neighbors on Lowell Lake Road happy um, regarding that situation, we're more than happy to work with. And would you need to um, talk to the road crew? I would imagine we'd probably have to have a conversation with the select board and the highway foreman. Would you be prepared to do that before the opening this year? Yeah. yeah. Good thought. 
Okay, well, I failed in getting us done by seven, but we're doing great. And uh, most importantly, I, I to uh, add to what Ethan said, the level of interest and concern um, is really helpful and important. And we have a strong community here, a strong community interest. And that's only going to be beneficial to the further management of the park and to the resource there. So we appreciate you coming out and staying uh, staying involved. Thank you.